Okay. All right. Hi, Annie. Obviously, uh, we've known each other for quite some time, but uh, our audience probably has never met you. I will ask you some basic questions about your fund, about sure. yourself, and you can start from whatever. You can start telling the world about uh, your fund, and then we'll go to your role in that fund. Great. So let me introduce BGV first. We are an early stage uh, B2B uh, fund that's based uh, here in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. We also have offices uh, actually in Western Europe, in uh, France and in Israel. And um, we invest in what we call enterprise 4.0 startups. And when we say early stage, we mean seed or series A. So uh, when we think about the enterprise B2B uh, evolution, uh, Sasha, you know, we feel that, you know, there was kind of enterprise 1.0, which was from 1970 to the early 1990s. That was basically the birth of Silicon Valley. Uh, that was all about, you know, mainframe to client server architectures, the focus, it was the birth of the PCs. Um, and, you know, out came companies like Intel and, you know, uh, folks like uh, Microsoft and, you know, Apple and all these iconic companies. Uh, the early adopters of these technologies were companies, uh, you know, either universities or government agencies, because there really wasn't kind of a mainstream deep on technology at that time. We then kind of went through what I would call enterprise 2.0, which was, you know, I'd say uh, early 1995 to about 2008. And fundamentally, this was uh, the birth of the internet. So I remember my partner, Eric, was on the board of uh, Netscape when the first, uh, you know, uh, browser uh, internet browser was launched back in 1995, I think August. And this basically, you know, started driving this whole issue on internet and web computing. And you saw you know, data centers come up, you saw the birth of laptops, and a lot of infrastructure centric uh, companies came out of this. Uh, these are companies like, you know, Cisco, you know, 3Com, which both Eric and my partner were at, uh, Juniper, you had all the telco guys come out, out of that. And you started seeing enterprise technology now getting more broadly applied within financial services, with the large banks. You saw high tech companies uh, adopting technology. You saw retail with Amazon trying to adopt technology. And then what we saw was the third wave of enterprise was kind of between 2008 and 18. That was basically the birth of the cloud. And this was all about cloud computing, focus on data and APIs. You had smartphones becoming prolific. And mobile and cloud applications was what it was all about. And I think the poster child for that, when you think about it, uh, are companies uh, like you know, uh, Salesforce, Google, and so on and so forth. And you saw enterprise IT technology now being adopted in healthcare, you know, beyond retail and financial services and new sectors. What we believe right now and what we're investing is we're on the threshold of basically, I'd say another 10 to 15 year cycle, which is going to be driven by enterprise 4.0. What does that really mean? These are basically companies that are, you know, innovative B2B startups that are combining some type of artificial intelligence, uh, intelligent automation, and proprietary data uh, to create kind of what I would call a virtual cycle of ROI improvement for uh, enterprises, either through vertical solutions or through cloud native security or through programmable cloud infrastructure. So that's basically you know, what we invest in. Uh, and what's interesting about this, and it's exci exciting also, Sasha, for us is that uh, these set of companies and this set of technologies are going much more broadly disrupting markets like automotive, like logistics, like manufacturing, like energy. So it's a much more broad uh, uh, application of enterprise technology than has ever been. So we see this as being very ripe. We also believe that a lot of these startups are going to come from different parts of the world, uh, not only just Silicon Valley. So to give you an example. Uh, that was actually yeah, my basic question to you. Oh, thank you for this yeah. such a substantive uh, description of your fund. You have answered like several questions I was going to ask, but you have answered them. Uh, yeah, you and uh, your partner Eric and you started working internationally and globally at a time when it was not popular in Silicon Valley, right? You just, uh, yeah. people would stick to local companies and I wouldn't say they were afraid to go to other geographies, but just didn't know how. And Eric and you have been doing it for quite a long time. So will you comment on what, what are the basic difference from the companies you bring, say from France or Israel 
do you bring them to Silicon Valley or you actually invest in the geographies? If you clarify your international. Uh, we actually, uh, yeah, so two, two types of investments. Sometimes they may be very early stage and they're still in the local geos. Uh, but we always uh, have to believe that there's a broader market and the, and the founder has a vision to come to the U.S. So that, that's a necessary condition. If they just want to stay in the domestic geography, there's not much value we can add. But what we do is we can invest when they're in their home country, in the local geo, or we can intercept them when they're starting the process of coming to the U.S. Uh, and mm -hmm. what we do is uh, a few things. Number one, we connect them to U.S. Uh, customers and partners because product market fit is different whether your company is started in France or Israel or India. Uh, and the second thing is uh, important is to actually help them recruit the right talent to augment the team. Because a lot of, a lot of times these are very tech, technology intensive companies and they may need to recruit people in the U.S. on this dev, go to market, sales, so on and so forth. And the third part of it is obviously once they advance is to actually connect them to later stages pockets of capital that's required to take them to the next level. So that's kind of, uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, 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 thank you for that. And, and uh, that actually, uh, I'd like to uh, comment on this one. Uh, our audience also has some emerging investors. You know, there are many people who made money in other industries in different countries, and they want to be investors in the US. And we always tell them that money by itself is of no interest because there's plenty of money in the valley. So when we say that uh, a venture capitalist is like smart money and you just describe what you do with it, it's not they just wrote the check. You actually build a partnership with your portfolio companies. So if you were to recommend a beginning investor the best way to get into a high tech field, would it be by investing in a fund like yours? Would it be a direct investment? Like what would be your recommendation? excuse me, your recommendation to someone who already has made money but never invested in Silicon Valley, what's the best way to do, to enter this field? Sure, I'll, I'll give you the answer which is based on, uh, you know, my own experience. So, you know, obviously Eric and I were at 3Com, you know, we were execs uh, in the late 90s. And when we left, we started BGV in 2005. Uh, uh, and the reason we did that was fundamentally we had both been doing angel investing, direct angel investing. And what we found was the problem with that is you don't get any portfolio diversification, right? So if you make two direct investments, they better play out. And one of the essence of you know, venture capital, as you know, Sasha, is you, know, you have to have portfolio diversification. So in the early days, when he formed BGV1, he and I basically invested our own capital. And we had a portfolio of about, I think about 13 or 14 companies. You know, We invested in companies uh, uh, you know, like, uh, Voltaire that was out of Israel that went IPO. Uh, we invested in Context Stream, came out of Israel, was the first software defined networking company. Uh, and we, ha we had a pretty good uh, track record and success there. And we learned at that point that, you know, if, if you want to basically invest directly, you better have a deep pocket of capital so that you can get portfolio diversification yourself. If you don't have that deep pocket of capital and you're not a super angel, then it's better to invest in a fund and then maybe co-invest them alongside with them in companies that you see are being successful. So a lot of our investors, uh, Sasha, are basically, you know, I would say um, high net worth, you know, family offices, CEOs of public technology companies, private technology companies, or even other industries. And what they do is they basically use us to get into an early stage and then they may come into Series A or write a co-investment check, but it's not, they get both the benefits of portfolio diversification but they also don't have to invest themselves to build a full VCP arm. Now, having said that, there are some very successful investors like Andy Bechtel-Scheim, who invested first in Google. Uh, you know, he invests on his own, but you know, he invests in a hundred million dollars, right? So I mean, he's got a lot of capital. Right. right. Now, uh, you obviously have a wide base of uh, limited partners who invested in your fund, and some of them are local family offices or institutions. Some of them are outside investors. Do you see a difference in their behavior? Because what I have noticed um, that when people come from some emerging markets as an LP, they want to participate in the decision-making process, like in the investment process. And I usually try and explain to them the difference between a limited and a general partner. Because once you gave, invested your money, you just kind of sit back a little and let the team run the investment process. 
uh, how do you work with your limited partners? Do you just send them um, reviews monthly, quarterly, or you actually let them on in the investment process as well? Yes, I would say we have three types of investors. Uh, I would say we have a set of uh, very sophisticated institutional investors uh, who are traditional LPs. Uh, and these folks invest and they basically just want to see what the returns are and you know good progress is being made and we're making good decisions. So I think that's one set of investors. Uh, I would say we have a second set of investors who are strategic investors. So these are corporates. These are large corporates uh, who may not have a presence in Silicon Valley. And they actually have a dual angle. Not only do they want to get good return on the investment, but they want to see deal flow that's relevant to their business so that they can actually bring new technology of digital transformation into their companies. So with these set of uh, you know, investors, we actually uh, engage more closely. So we basically share our deal flow with them because we have a sense of what they're looking to invest in. We send them companies, we have quarterly review meetings with them. So it's a little bit tighter collaboration because that's what they're looking to accomplish. And it's good for us because what it does for us, Sasha, is it uh, helps inform our investment thesis because you know, these are big, big companies who are kind of deep into kind of solving problems that some of these startups are trying to solve. So it helps, you know, they can become go-to-market partners, maybe investors. So that's, that's the second part. And third, we have, I would say, you know, a set of active investors, okay? These are kind of multifamily offices uh, who want to basically uh, work alongside us to make co-investments. And they're, they're basically, you know, a handful of people. They're not like in the 20, 30 members. Uh, and with them, we basically, you know, they have a very clear criteria. Some of them want to come in at series B and beyond when some of the fundamental technology and go-to-market risks have been addressed. And we basically keep them informed. We expose them to the company when the series B comes up and they co-invest alongside writing big checks. Uh, there's others who basically want, who have a higher risk tolerance and they're willing to write checks in series A and series B. Uh, I mean, series C and series A. And we actually, when we, uh, write a term sheet, we create a co-investment vehicle to invest alongside us uh, in those companies. And we send them an investment memo and share the information with them and they do that. So I would say that's kind of the mix. Uh, having said that, I would say two thirds of our LPs fall into the first category and the other one third fall into the other two I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we live in interesting times. And uh, obviously the COVID uh, environment has changed many ways people live and work. From your perspective, when it comes to venture capital, how has it changed the um, process, your, your investment process within your fund? Obviously, we cannot travel as much, and most of the stuff is happening like this on the meetings on Zoom. Has it slowed down your investment, make it longer, you're switching, change? Well, just tell me what has changed. Sure. Um, so let me talk about the macro, and I'll talk about the micro also, if that helps. Okay. So at a macro level, what we're seeing is with COVID, uh, there's uh, three things that are happening. One is there's an acceleration of automation. Uh, it varies by industry, whether you happen to be in logistics, financial services, or retail. Uh, but what's happening is, you know, a lot of these uh, companies are telling their CIOs and CISOs that they have to reduce their budgets by 10, 15, 20, 25%. So what that means is they have to do more with less. And fundamentally, the only way to do that is some type of intelligent automation. So we're seeing that happen. So, you know, we've got portfolio companies that are basically, you know, addressing things in manufacturing on advanced analytics to reduce defects. They're getting more tailwinds. We've got companies that are providing infrastructure for basically e-commerce platforms uh, for more brands to go to, you know, uh, online faster. They're getting tailwinds. So that's the first thing we're seeing, some type of acceleration automation at the macro level. I think the second thing we're seeing, uh, Sasha, is this remote working is becoming the new normal. I don't believe we'll ever go back to the way we used to have it. Maybe some of it will come back, but it's not gonna be you know, pendulum swing all the way back. Uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of white collar you know, work is becoming what I would call the untethered you know, workforce. Uh, some key areas, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Think about sales, right? Traditionally, the sales model was you would go to the customer, you'd fly there, you know, you'd meet with the customer. What's kind of an unbelievable is that models got turned on its head right now if we talk to some customers and today customers, enterprise customers spend less than 20% in physical meetings with the vendor. Uh, they spend 80% of the time trying the product, uh, POCs, researching the product online, getting information, getting kind of, you know, peer level testimonies before making that decision. So what that means is now 
it's not that the, decision, the top down decision making has disappeared in terms of budget, but you have to complement that with a bottom up sales motion. So I think we're seeing uh, startups that are delivering kind of, you know, the types of technology that enables remote working, whether it's around collaboration or remote marketing, or remote sales are succeeding. That's, that's number two. Mm -hmm. And the third thing we're seeing is there's really um, some new business models that are emerging. The first one we're seeing is direct to consumer. You know, B2B didn't really deal with, you know, direct to consumer, but uh, we've got portfolio companies that uh, from Israel, this company Flytrex, they're basically, uh, they've got software that can manage fleets of drones. They're doing pilots at Walmart to do last mile delivery in suburban areas uh, because people are not going to the stores to pick up things. Uh, we are seeing, you know, scale fast a portfolio company. They're enabling brands to do the same thing all the way from full uh, what Amazon provides in terms of the full value chain of services, they're doing that. Um, so we're seeing those kind of, you know, business models kind of emerging a lot faster. That's at the macro level. Uh, mm -hmm. You asked also, you know, micro level, what are we seeing in terms of deals and, you know, how we are working? Uh, we are definitely seeing that uh, I would say for VCs, traditionally, you have to meet the entrepreneur, you have to get to know them. That's a critical part of your diligence or evaluate the quality of the team, how they interact with you, how they answer questions, so on and so forth, right? Um, well, that's a stretch, right? So uh, what have we done? We've probably, you know, we made about uh, three investments so far. We'll be closing another two uh, in the next month or two. Uh, we have probably biased more towards in, uh, entrepreneurs who we have worked with or known in the past. Having said that, there are two new, uh, two new entrepreneurs investing in, and we're finding creative ways to get to know them. So for example, my partner, uh, Yash, is making one investment, and he actually uh, you know, went to Stanford Park for four hours, and he and this founder entrepreneur, they walked, and they talked through a lot of issues to get to, get to know the person in a you know, social distance environment, so to speak. So I, I think those are things that are kind of changing. I would say there's a lot more emphasis on syndication so that you know you're trying to de-risk the unknown entrepreneur right whether it's through uh, somebody you invested in before as a repeat entrepreneur or through investors you have worked with and then thirdly some of these kind of uh, things that we're trying to do so i would say that's the biggest challenge it's kind of stretched out the time it takes to do diligence uh, but having said that uh, you know we see industry you know you sometimes you see really good deals you have to move fast uh, and we recently kind of closed a very interesting investment in a company that's applying basically AI to satellite image data to help basically, you know, really uh, do management of remote assets for large oil and gas companies and large utilities. And it was a very interesting deal. Uh, and from the time we met the company, did the diligence and wrote the term sheet was literally six weeks. So it, it was pretty quick. Yeah, and I cannot not ask a question about uh, some of the, you know, syndicated deals uh, we all had uh, with Chinese investors and, and companies. And now uh, what it looks like with the CPUs, and all that other stuff, it, it's becoming harder to um, work with the Chinese in, in, in investors. And you know, the next year it could be someone else. But my question is, when, when, if we're in the investment world, can we really separate ourselves from the political environment where um like when you worked at tricom for example i know that you 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 had a bunch of exposure to you know including some chinese companies so do you yeah. guys still do deals with, with, with china or are you scaling scaling it down so yeah so we uh, so let me answer the question uh, along a few vectors sasha i think uh, first of all syndication is going to be really really important because what we're seeing is um there's few, more, you know, when you, in cycles like this, you know, most VCs move to late stage. So there's less capital coming into early stage, right? So you have to syndicate. You don't want to take that risk, you know, just by yourself, by the very nature of it. So what that means is the bar goes up on who your syndication partners are. So for example, um, you know, there was a lot of capital flowing very freely from China. A lot of CVCs from China were coming in. Uh, and we actually had a few deals where we had lead term sheets from CVCs and all that stuff went to a complete from 100 miles an hour to zero, literally, you know, within like, you know, uh, three or four months. So we are being much more careful to not create that geopolitical exposure, to be honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, you know, there's some very simple rules. I mean, you know, if you're working with Chinese uh, corporate ventures, 
you have to make sure they have an entity that's investing out from the US. If they are, then you don't have the same set of issues about money transfer. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think the bar has definitely gone up. Uh, and I think, you know, we have a very curated list of, you know, either pure VCs we syndicate with or CVCs we invest with. And we have to know them very well to kind of bring them into the cap table today because it's probably a lot more difficult today than it was, you know, even a year, year and a half ago. Uh, and then the second part of it is, you know, I would say China was seen as a big market and a lot of our portfolio companies, I'd say even three, four, five years ago, we would help them go there and do things. You know, we've got a partner, Shuo, who helps do biz dev in China. Uh, I would say a lot of that has come to almost a complete standstill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see the same thing in other funds we talk to are in a similar situation, but you know, we'll just keep an eye. We'll, we'll, see, we'll, see, yeah. we'll see how it goes. Yeah. The final no, question. Go ahead, go ahead. No, you wanted to say something, say something. I would say, you know, Asia, it's kind of, it, it's the balance of power seems to be shifting. I think Korea is becoming a lot stronger. I think Japan is seeing a resurgence in VC. So I think we'll see more capital coming from uh, those type of geographies than you've seen before. Right, I agree. I agree with that. So in a final question, um, words of wisdom, <laughs> what, what your advice would be to uh, a startup who wants to enter Silicon Valley? Uh, what is the best strategy for them to find an investor like you? And, uh, and, and the second question, the same advice for um, a potential investor into the fund if he wants to be a limited partner in a fund like yours. So what would you recommend they start with? Yeah, so I think for entrepreneurs, I would say do your homework. Uh, you know, finding a VC and working with a VC, it's, uh, you know, when you do early stage investment, uh, it's kind of sad, but you know, the usual relationship between a VC and an entrepreneur lasts maybe six to 10 years it's more than the average marriage lasts in the US, okay, in terms of divorce rates. So it's a long-term partnership. So you have to be careful how you select that VC. And I would say it's a sales process. You have to understand, uh, do they invest in the stage that you're at? Do they invest in the sectors you're uh, building the company in? And do they have the competence and capability that you will need to build the kind of company you're trying to build? And I think a lot of that, the, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to do that homework upfront study their website, see investments they made and do that. Because if, if you don't do that, you end up, you, you spin your wheels talking to the wrong VCs. So I think that can be very frustrating for entrepreneurs. I would say pre-qualification is very important. Uh, and getting, you know, warm introductions from fellow entrepreneurs who work with the VC or from others is really, really helpful. I think that's, especially in this day and age. I would say for uh, investors, I would say, uh, you know, investors have to really understand what the risk tolerance and profile is in VC. Uh, if they want to early stage or late stage. So that's the number one. And number two, I would say, you know, really, they have to really, it's back to basics, Sasha. You would have, if I'm an LP, I would really look at uh, the team itself because uh, there was some shocking data that was released by, uh, I think, SVB uh, maybe three months ago. And they said something like 70% of fund managers in the US uh, have not seen a recessionary cycle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well. And, yeah, and that's kind of scary because, uh, it, you know, everybody's smart, but, you know, as humans, we learn through experience. Uh, so if you have a team that has operating experience and that has been through multiple cycles, uh, it's probably easier for them to basically navigate to the cycle, having seen it a few times versus trying to figure stuff out on the fly first time go around. So I would say, you know, do your diligence on the team and really understand if they have the capabilities to, you know, really help the companies make a difference. I mean, our mantra to our entrepreneurs is only one thing. We have one job to make sure they don't make any mistakes we have made or we have seen made because every mistake you make equals the pivot and every pivot you make equals, you know, lost capital or, you know, poor capital efficiency. Yeah, you brought up a really good point because to some people like this is it, the sky is falling and obviously this crisis is uh, different from what we've seen before. But even in my career in Silicon Valley, this is my third crisis I've seen. So I know that you still need to continue yeah. to work. And yeah, you, know, you know what you're talking about, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Anik. It was a pleasure talking to you. And now your fund will be known to a bigger international audience. And uh, if they do their homework, they'll figure out the way how to work with you. And I'm looking forward right. to many more meetings with you and Eric. It's always a pleasure. Thank Likewise. You. Thank you so much, Sasha. Take care. Bye-bye.